morning, Alicia. It's nice to hear your voices once in a while. You know, it really is. I know you guys have to be on mute, but it's really nice to hear your voices. And, okay, Shania, you just joined us? Okay. All right, students who are just joining us, I'm, I'm so glad you are here. Uh, because being in your classes is like literally 50% of the hardship of coming and being involved in school, virtual school. So that's a great thing. But please be a little bit more on time because, um, yeah, if you miss something, then you're going to be like, what is she talking about? Martin Luther King holiday. So it's really not a holiday, it's supposed to be a day of service, so I hope you have something planned for Monday. You do not have school. Uh, administration offices are uh, closed as well, but there may be some opportunities. Uh, I don't know because of COVID. I know that um, at my daughter's school, they're having a voluntary Martin Luther King Jr. Um, sock wrapping, which is uh, just taking socks, like sweat socks, things like that. And they are, um, you know, wrapping them up for less fortunate people and then sending them to an organization. So they're trying to get little ones involved in the idea of using the day as not just a holiday, but as a day of service. Um, so just think of what you can do. Maybe there's some online opportunities too um, at this time. I'm sure that someone has thought of something. The end of the marking period is the 22nd, and I hope to you know, try to get all the grades up um, by the end of the day Monday. Um, so it's going to be a workathon for me. Um, and I have been uh, doing some grading throughout the marking period, but I, I feel like uh, truly I need to do a lot more. Um, and some, some of you, I have posted grades, and um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that you still need to uh, to finish. So let's use this time wisely in the next week um, and over the next three days. Um, you might have gotten some calls from the school uh, yesterday and we because we were given the task of just calling students on a list. I had a lot of students that I didn't even have. Um, yes, if you turned it in to, um, you, did you attach it to the Google Classroom? Yeah, as long as you attach, yes, put it there. Okay, don't email it me to me. What you want to do, and if I have a, a, a difficult time um, with its formatting or it's not coming up because of the type of file it is, I will let you know. Okay, I will let you know right away. There was a little difficulty with somebody last marking period, and I just couldn't see her photos. And it just became this huge thing. Um... I don't know what ha why it had to, but it just, she got really upset. And I had to share my screen with her. I said, look, I can't see your, your file. You have to give it to me, um, you know, in some sort of a PDF or JPEG or some sort of common file that I can, I can see. I'm not quite sure. Maybe it was like a, a special phone kind of file. Uh, PNGs, I can see PNGs. So if you're worried about PNGs, I can see PNG files too. But the one thing I'm going to ask you, because people have been continually doing this is please turn your images so that uh, when you post them they're oriented in the correct direction they're not like upside down because I have no way of turning them in Google Classroom I know that sounds dumb but Google Classroom <laughs> doesn't have that capability to rotate photos um, even their zoom doesn't make sense because I can't get a I can't zoom in even properly with their kind of zoom. It like zooms in on a weird spot. So you have to, at, on your end, when you post the photos, please, you you have the photo capability to, um, the editing capability on your cell phones, please turn them in the correct direction and then post them, take a look, and just make sure that you didn't post something that's sideways, that's all. It will make looking at your work a whole lot easier because the way I, the only way I'm evaluating is by looking, besides the research papers, um, it's, it's by looking, and it's a totally visual thing. So if it's a really bad picture or if it's upside down, um, that's not going to help like give you the most optimal 
presentation for your highest grade, you know? And the same thing for taking good photographs, but we already went over that. So I'm not, you know, I posted a video on taking good photographs. We watched a video on taking good photos of your artwork in, uh, in class. So that, that's already been covered. So this is, um, this is Friday. So it's really a day of review and reflection of what we have learned. Uh, for the two-point perspective, we got as far as um, this, where we drew the corner of our room and where we drew two windows and made our windows look three-dimensional. Okay, We started to sketch out the beginnings of the position of the bed, but we didn't really talk about kind of these basic things. So today I just want to back it up a little bit. <laughs> so we were talking about posting good pictures of our work. Um, we were also talking about um, the Martin Luther King holiday and how um, you can spend that holiday, what you can do, you know, a volunteer service or making up work if you are behind on your work. Um, I also showed uh, the class where we were with the two-point perspective. We're going to continue the two-point perspective uh, next week and finish that up. But today I just wanted to talk about, um, just back it up a tiny bit and talk about some basic terminology and vocabulary that we should all know, okay? So we didn't really talk about, we might work on this a little bit if you guys wanna do that. Um, I'll, I'll ask you in a, a few minutes. But the thing about um, perspective is we should also discuss scale and size. So size is basically, right, how big or small an object is. It's a very basic thing, right? Um, but scale is very different. Scale is, uh, it has to do with size, but it really has to do with size relationships between two things. And, well, kind of like being the dominant species on this planet, why am I talking about dominant species? Um, we determine the scale of things that we build around us and compare everything else to us because that's how um, self-centered human beings are, right? And it's, it has to really do with our own uh, survival and creating a, an environment that makes our lives easier. So when we talk about scale, we are comparing everything to us, our height and our size in this world. So um, I'm talking about size, scale, and proportion and the difference between the three. So proportion is the size relationship of parts to a whole. So let's say one of the problems that we come across when drawing is somebody might, we will draw the human figure in someone always does this. They'll make the legs too short, okay? So I might say, well, Kiera, I think that your figure's legs are a little bit too short in, propor in proportion to the upper body. So can you make it a little bit longer looking? So then that is a problem with proportion, okay? One of scale. So let's go back to scale and the sizes of things in relation to one another. Um, just size in general, too, is the first decision most artists make when they are creating a piece of artwork. How big should I make the piece of artwork? All right. Um, if you make something on a big scale, it's going to look grand. It's going to elicit feelings of wonder and awe. If you've ever seen a painting that covered almost a whole wall of a large room like in a museum it's very impressive it is very very impressive whereas um, it's and you feel humbled and you maybe even feel a feeling of reverential respect like oh my god look how awesomely big this statue is or this painting is um when you are looking at something small, it's a lot more approachable. And sometimes it may even be considered cute, cute, pleasing, and agreeable. Those are some of the 
the words that may come to mind when you are looking at something very small. And, and it has certain effects on your psychology. Um, certain th things that are small, like miniature things, can include bonsai. You know, the tr like this really small trees they clip to make them look like big trees. But when you're actually there, it's like a really tiny tree. But it's manicured and clipped in a way to make it look like almost like a full-size tree in some sort of pot that makes it look like it's in a natural setting. When you are looking at a photograph of something, it just does not give you an accurate sense of the scale of an artwork. That's why I'm going to tell you right now, when this thing is over, this COVID thing is over, go out to a real, the actual museum, go out to a sculpture park, go out to where a piece of art is and look at it in real life. It, it really is a totally different experience. When I saw one of the most famous paintings in the world, the Mona Lisa, I was a little disappointed. Why would, why would I be disappointed? Because all my life, the Mona Lisa has had songs dedicated to it. It's been hyped all over the place, but the painting was relatively small compared to what I thought in my head it would look like. It's only 22 inches by 30 inches. What's so special is her ambiguous expression. That is what's famous about her because it's one of those few paintings earlier on, there's been other paintings like this since, where the sitter, the Mona Lisa person, the woman, is looking straight out at the viewer. So that's kind of considered a little bit bold for a woman to do. And then not only that, her mouth is painted in a way that looks like she's smiling. Mona Lisa smile, it's a very, very famous kind of thing, right? Um, there's even a, a, a movie called Mona Lisa smile. Um, and the smile might just be her just, you know, she might have a resting smile face, <laughs> but some people can read into it. Why is this woman looking out at me, especially if you're a man? And why does she have this kind of mysterious smile? It might be perceived as kind of like a knowing smile, a flirtatious smile. So there's a great mystery. What is this person thinking? And it might just be overhyped because it is an earlier painting by a great artist. So Leonardo da Vinci was a brilliant you know, Renaissance man. He did great, great things. He, and he was just absolutely genius as, as a person, not just in art. You, yeah, Nika, you, you think it's overhyped? It might be. Yeah, because when I, my perception of it in real life, when I'm not saying you shouldn't go to the Louvre in France and look at the Mona Lisa. I completely encourage you to do that. And then you could also look at the winged victory sculpture, the, the Nike of Samothrace, the original one is there too. And experience all the, like the original, authentic, real things. Because oftentimes in this virtual world, nothing is authentic, right? And it's, it's, it is different to experience something authentically. So go out there in your lifetime and I want you to look at these things. And then call me up and tell me, Anika, how you feel about it. <laughs> What's my favorite work of art? Hmm. I'm gonna, you're going to have to give me some time to think about that. I mean, really, seriously, I cannot think about... I was really into Salvador Dali, so it goes in phases. I, You know, that artist, whatever was my favorite, has changed as I've gotten older. So my very first... Hmm. You're going to have to give me a little bit of time on that one. The standard of measurement is the human being. And you go, wow, that is a humongous mountain. Look how much bigger that mountain is to this person standing in front of that, in, in front of that mountain. So um, humans, it's like, you know, the human being is the measure, is the standard of measurement for scale. Um, uh, because of course, you know, this is kind of like, you know, this is all the stuff in our mind.
And once you kind of like go out outside of the norm, so-called norm, there are standards for scale. But once you go outside the norms of scale, that's when things get really bizarre or interesting. So how many people have ever read Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll? So Mulan, there is a whole part, right? Do you remember the part when Alice grows really, really big? And then she gets really, really small. Yes. So that became weird and wonderful. And it stands out as one of these dramatic top from a potion. Yes. And there was also like, wasn't there like a little cake that then she ate that and then it shrunk, shrunk her back. I forgot if it shrunk her back or made her bigger. But that whole weird and wonderful chapter that stands out to readers it does stand out because Alice became incredibly big. In, and everything in, in that world of Wonderland suddenly became very small and it became very difficult for her to maneuver herself in that environment. And then the same thing with being extremely small, she started shrinking and becoming even smaller than the room itself. So then let's say like the tables in the room were towering way above her head. She couldn't reach anything. And at one point she tried to reach a key to open a door and she could never reach it because she was too small. And it presented, it presented an interesting predicament. So when she was large, she couldn't get through the door. When she was small, she just couldn't even reach the key. So there's a certain scale which is not practical for people in uh, careers like architecture and engineering. You cannot make buildings that are too so small that a human cannot occupy them or even walk into them, right? But in art, the rules are completely different, right? That part, particular part in Alice in Wonderland is fantastical. It fires up your imagination with all of these possibilities because of this idea of something of being so small and having an environment that was looming huge, like being inside a giant's house, is really interesting and fantastical, right? Fantastic. I don't even think fantastical is a real word, actually. But, and being really tiny is incredible. And being really huge and having people be real, I mean, everything be really small, your environment is also a kind of interesting situation, just like um, in Gulliver's Travels, he, where he goes to the land, there is a there's a story you guys might know this where this man, he gets shipwrecked and he wakes up on the shores of this island and everybody is tiny, and everybody has these tiny little houses, and they they like pin his hair strands down when they don't know what kind of a violent person or is he bad is he good, so they like tie him down and then he just like gets right up because he's humongous and powerful. And then they try to feed him and he, he eats like two months supply of food because he's so much bigger than them. Like a watermelon is like the size of his fingernail or something. So, um, you know, he's humongous. But that is kind of like how interesting scale can be to an artist. So I wanted to show you how artists use perception, how you perceive scale and size, because a lot of that is important in perspective drawing. So I wanted to share with you some of the work of um, Klaus Oldenburg, who is a famous sculptor, and his wife, uh, Kush van Buren, who passed away um, you know, a couple years ago, did a lot of sculpt sculptures with her husband. They were a team that made, um, that played with this idea of scale and took everyday objects and blew them up to these humongous uh, sizes uh, just to get people kind of thinking about size and scale and their environment. And it was just kind of interesting. And he made several pieces for the city of Philadelphia that a lot of you have already encountered. You might have even sat on them or touched them or leaned up against them. So um, let me just present them to you. If you've never known about this artist, you're going to know about him now. I love his work. He's a sculptor and he takes everyday objects and turns them into these humongous sculptures. And sometimes they do things and other times they do not. This is considered pop art. You would put his work in the genre of pop art. The Cherry Spoon Bridge. 
And at the top of the cherry stem is a fountain and water comes out of this piece. You're really not supposed to walk on this piece because of course it's dangerous. Here's a gigantic stamp um, sitting on the lawn uh, somewhere. These uh, sculptures are um, located all around the country. And let me see if I can find um, Philadelphia sculptures because I, like I said, he came here and he created some really, really iconic pieces and you have seen them. Have you all seen this at night? The little, this is not poo folks, okay? <laughs> This is not poo. This is a little pile of paint and at night there's a light inside and it lights up. The reason for this paintbrush at this location is that this paintbrush is right near the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. So these things all have meaning and Klaus Oldenburg didn't just randomly select a paintbrush or a button or electrical socket. He chose things that were very site specific. So this is a, a, a paintbrush that is located on the canvas of the oldest art school in the country, which is in Philadelphia. Philadelphia has a lot of firsts. So you have to kind of admire our city, no matter what you think. It's, Philadelphia did a lot of, has a lot of firsts. So this is the paint, a paintbrush by Klaus Oldenburg. You can see from this student right here with the backpack, just how big it is. This piece uh, is like a broken button, is um, on the campus of the University of Pennsylvania. The button has four holes and they represent the four squares in the city of Philadelphia. Like there's Rittenhouse Square, called squares, but Logan Circle is not even a square, it's a circle. <laughs> but it's, it's kind of like a major, I guess, gathering point at some point. And this piece, you all know this, right? It's right next to City Hall, is the clothespin. And he chose these things for their significance. So they do all have some sort of meaning Okay. Well, you do have to know a little tiny bit about art history to, to understand why he chose the clothespin. Um, so if you want to, okay, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you um, Brancusi's The Kiss. So Constantine Brancusi is a artist and another sculptor, and he created this very, very blocky. It is two human figures embracing and kissing. And one looks like a female figure because there's a little bit of a bulge right there on the chest area. And um, Klaus Oldenburg's uh, pin is a homage. Does anyone know, know what an homage means, an homage? An homage is kind of like a dedication to something where you're like praising something else and referring to something else, like saying, my piece is kind of like an homage um, or a dedication to a, another type of piece um, that, it, that has similarities to it. So the clothespin looks like uh, two figures that are embracing because Philadelphia is what? What is it called? Brother this brotherly love, right? So it doesn't matter if this figure is two men or two, it's just two people who are embracing, who are showing great love for each other. So one half of the clothespin is a human, is a, a, a person, and the other half is another person. And the little metal springy piece is supposed to represent kind of the um, an arm kind of, you know, going around um, one, wrapping around the other. So it's it's kind of a cute, cute uh, figure. At first, when I saw that, I was completely stumped. I had no idea why he chose a clothespin at all. So there's a couple of them in Philadelphia. I just wanted to talk about, talk to you about scale and that, um, you can have something become a work of art um, if you decide to work at some sort of an extraordinary scale. That's one way. The Another type of art 
that happens when you shrink down, do the opposite thing, and you shrink something down is miniatures. Uh, making things extremely small, but sometimes even functional, where the lights turn on, uh, and I'm talking about people who, um, you can make miniature models and architecture of buildings to show people what you're going to build. So that, and architects definitely use scale. Um, but they ha they'll tell you it's like one to 23 scale, whatever that means. Uh, what one inch will represent 23, uh, what is it? One, one inch will equal like 23 feet, you know? So they have that and it's written, show you like this. it'll be written like this. Whenever you see a number like that, okay? So it's like one inch of that represents 23 feet of that. So there is some sort of a scale or one, yeah, I guess it's a one to 10. One inch will represent um, 10 feet. So they will kind of tell you what scale that they're working at when they create their sculpture. Now I have a piece I am gonna share with you, which is a miniature. So I want you to click on my screen for just a second. I'm gonna share with you something special. Coffee time. <laughs> so this is the opposite that, of that type of art. This is called miniature art. And um, yes, uh, let me turn it on and it lights up the little sign lights up and the umbrella under the umbrella there's a little light too right there. okay so i just wanted to share with that and this is mrs han getting some coffee time so this is in 123rd scale so this mrs han is 23 times smaller than the real me and the coffee house is 23 times smaller than actual scale these you could get at a hobby lobby or craft store or online so they take forever they're cheap because you have to build everything because you're the labor but what they do provide you is like a couple pieces of really cheap balsa wood lightweight wood some paper um so you might want to get into that kind of art if you if you like to do that it's very stress relieving. So I'm going to leave it at that and I'm going to let you go have a nice long weekend. It took two days, but a lot of hours. Yes, that's how I spent with my daughter uh, two days of our winter break because I just wanted to do something with her. So we had a lot of fun. So you guys, a creative hobby suggestion for you guys, okay? <laughs> have a good day. Okay. Take care, Aya. Have a nice weekend. You guys take advantage of the three-day weekend. You too. Thank you. If you guys have stuff to do, this is an opportunity. All right. Bye-bye.